We are live. We're good. All right. Good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. Thanks for joining us on the uh, online streaming live on YouTube uh, from the Digital Innovation Pavilion here at uh, at COP. Uh, pleasure to be here with you today. My name is David Greenall, uh, Global Managing Director for Climate Risk, Decarb, Nature and Adaptation with KPMG International. Uh, I am also the Chair of the Board of Novosphere, uh, a not-for-profit that uh, has the pleasure of hosting the Secretariat for the Climate Chain Coalition, uh, which has uh, has put on the Digital Innovation Pavilion this year, um, led by uh, led by Miro. Uh, it's my real pleasure today to be joined by um, three panelists. Uh, we have a shorter panel, I should say, that uh, than was originally planned. Uh, but had some had some complications uh, that have led to uh, two of our, our panelists unfortunately not being able to be here with us today. But uh, but uh, I think that the three that we have with us uh, more than make up for the uh, the absence of uh, of the rest of our panel. Um, our topic today is on digital transformation and dis decentralized um, climate data infrastructures, uh, and really what we're focusing on today is looking at the disruptive and transformative uh, potential of blockchain-enabled uh, digital technologies, as well as other disruptive technologies such as AI, IoT, um, digital twins, and their ability uh, both individually as well as in combination with each other to really kind of foster the kind of action that we're, we're looking for uh, and needing to achieve in terms of achieving our, our kind of global challenges around uh, climate transition as well as um, on the uh, adaptation to the impacts of, of climate change. Um, what we're going to hopefully be able to dig into and drill down into are questions around what, uh, where does transformative and digital infrastructure, where does that fit into the uh, this larger challenge around uh, accessing, unlocking, and scaling uh, climate finance. What does it mean in terms of addressing uh, what I've referred to um, uh, previously and others have referred to in terms of the cr crisis of trust in the carbon markets uh, and how it can help to address some of the transparency uh, and measurement um, uh, and reporting uh, needs uh, of uh, of those marketplaces, as well as what I refer to as um, uh, the business model innovations and transformations that uh, that digital um, affords. Um, so, with that, maybe I'll ask each of our panelists to quickly introduce themselves, uh, give you a sense as to who they are and uh, and their organizations, and then we'll jump into a a kind of focused dialogue around uh, some of the key questions that I think um, each of them is working on and I think each of you will be interested in hearing about. So I'll pass it over to Wes. Awesome, thank you, David. And I just wanna say thank you to Miroslav and the team organizing the Digital Innovation Pavilion as well as KPMG for uh, co-hosting uh, with us and the EverCity team as well. Um, it's really great to be here and great to support the conversations around digital opportunities um, in the context of both the negotiation as well as supporting climate markets. So I helped lead a group called the HBAR Foundation Sustainable Impact Fund. Um, as part of that fund, we launched a $100 million grant fund for digital public goods back in 2022. Um, we deploy catalytic capital to both infrastructure and climate markets, as well as applications adopting that infrastructure that are focused on five key goals as part of our mission to bring the balance sheet of the planet to the public ledger. Um, what we're really focused on is enabling uh, those goals of making climate finance auditable, digitizing and open sourcing methodologies where we have the largest library of digitized and open source methodologies in the world, scaling validation and verification, not just improving the process, but actually uh, deploying validation and verification uh, funding for companies in the global south who want to scale validation and verification bodies into countries where they may not exist today, regions where they may not exist today. Um, and then as we go to deploy capital into making climate finance auditable and creating those methodologies and verifying them, build products that are based on data, carbon credits that are based on data, emissions tracking that's based on data and the audit trail from an MRV, where we can then discover global climate asset price as our fourth goal, 
to be able to understand attributes that are driven by data back to the source, not just around environmental impacts, but social impacts as well. And those assets we believe will live on corporate balance sheets, um, whether they're emissions, offsets, biodiversity credits or otherwise. And we wanna make ESG report incredible by knowing those assets, their origination, their methodologies, and the data that comes from them so that when we see an impact that a company's making, that consumers can believe in, that our governments can believe in, they're auditable, the information's discoverable, human understandable, and where there needs to be offsets or credits bought, recs bought, or any other type of environmental asset, they're liquid in a way where we can actually understand the market liquidity in a way that's not um, behind the counter OTC. It's a trusted market based on trusted data. And so that's us in a nutshell and um, happy to pass it over to Dinesh. Thank you. Thank you, Wes. Uh, first of all, thank you, David, for getting this opportunity. And uh, the kind of when I said digital innovation pavilion, I was like looking, looking for something which is quite innovative in terms of the digital side of it. But we are all human now. <laughs> so uh, I think uh, we, we have to exist to make the digital happening. Uh, so I'm Dinesh. I'm the executive uh, director of the Climate Action Data Trust, which is an initiative of the World Bank, uh, Government of Singapore, and International Emissions Trading Association. So the Climate Action Data Trust uh, links, uh, aggregates, and harmonizes the carbon credits uh, data from across all the carbon registries, independent and uh, compliance alike. And then it gives access to the uh, various users, uh, including the governments, exchanges, rating agencies, any any other, any form of stakeholders who are trying to get the value of the carbon credits from across the registries, which otherwise they have to visit these websites individually and then scrape the data and then do their analysis. So this platform provides a kind of a, uh, a, cent a central uh, repository of their data. We don't add any value to the data. It is just a mirroring of the data that exists in all these uh, registries. And as we speak to my right, uh, have Eco Registry was already connected with us. Uh, and then uh, we also have BioCarbon Registry connected with us and Global Carbon Council who have a booth here as well from Qatar. And just I came from the uh, launch of uh, Bhutan uh, National Carbon Registry connected to Climate Action Data Trust just now, just, just an hour ago. So that's how we are uh, embarked in this journey. Uh, and in the next uh, couple of years, we anticipate close to 50 countries to be connected uh, in, in terms of those, uh, the largest volumes of ITMOs that may come from these countries. And these countries have a benefit to access uh, the not only their own data, but across the world and then try to see the best practices and improvise their policy and regulations for uh, kind of having a better whitelist to, prom to promote more investments and therefore greater emission reductions as well. So that is a kind of a, a idea uh, we, are, we are moving forward. It's, it's a digital uh, public infrastructure for public goods. So therefore it's, it's a free access as of now. Uh, of course, moving forward, uh, what will be the type of business models? How should be the engagement with the stakeholders, especially the rating agency and the exchanges who need uh, frequent access to such data, how we can package it in a way that would be, uh, it would be creating a kind of a real time uh, kind of access to the information on the carbon market. So that's that's the uh, kind of a background. Maybe I'll ask you want to. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dinesh. And Thanks, David, for the invitation to speak in this panel and to Miro for hosting this Digital Innovation Pavilion. So, uh, EcoRegistry, what we do at EcoRegistry, we started from the beginning thinking about the project developers on the field, that it was very difficult for them to get access to, to these registry platforms or to the standards and to talk to them or so they didn't know what information needed to be submitted or something. So the first step that we did is to create a platform that guides them through the process so that they can upload all the information, all the data, all the documents that will lead at the end and will support the issuance of the carbon units. And then the other part that was very difficult for newcomers in the market was to connect to the international market. So we started developing this platform in a way that it could connect to multiple platforms. It can be exchanges, but also we are working a lot with digitized and monitoring reporting and verification solutions like the ones that are being sponsored and uh, yeah by HBAR Foundation, of course, because uh, what it will bring is a more data-driven market that allows data to be used to make informed decisions and actually bring high integrity and high quality into the market. Uh, yeah, that's our specialty, like the platform that we provide we provide this platform for standards, for independent standards, and also for countries. So that, that's it. Thank you. 
All right, thanks everyone for uh, for those introductions. Um, let's dig into the issue of uh, of finance uh, in terms of tra transition finance and, and the intersection of of digital with that. Um, you know, to set the broad context, as we're all aware, uh, if we look at the grand, you know, the the enormity of the challenge that we all face in terms of uh, getting to net zero, we're talking about uh, trillions of dollars of capital. Uh, annually needing to be deployed. Uh, at the same time, you know, uh, you know, in the order of billions of dollars of, uh, of value potentially being able to be created in, in various value pools, right, around uh, in action in this, in this area. Um, I think from the standpoint of capital markets and investors, uh, you know, they need to have, uh, we've talked about data, right, and information that underpins their investment decision-making uh, processes and, and, and calculus. Uh, at the end of the day, they need um, uh, access to information that is uh, is credible, it's trustworthy, and it's actionable. Um, in relation to that, I think some of the, the challenges, and you've already alluded to some of them, relate to issues around lack of standardization, uh, fragmentation, uh, lack of interoperability. Um, uh, and uh, kind of opacity in terms of lack of transparency. Okay? Um, so you know, the big question uh, is how can digitalization uh, help to address some of those fundamental challenges relating it back to the needs of investors and capital markets uh, so they can have access to the kind of information that they ultimately need to have in order to make those decisions and employ the deploy the capital that uh, that's re required to to move uh, investments in in climate finance. So uh, big big question. Uh, maybe if in relation to uh, open discussion, uh, in relation to each of the things that you're you're focused on, maybe if you can answer that question, give some examples around what you're doing and how it relates back to that that overarching challenge. I'll take that. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and one thing I'd like to say, like when we think about investor confidence, we have ITMOs, we have voluntary carbon market credits, but we also have emissions accounting, right? And, and we have the ETS systems that are based on credible, what's supposed to be credible emissions accounting. So we have hundreds of billions of dollars in the ETS systems. We have hundreds of millions to billions of dollars in the voluntary carbon markets, not including the ITMOs. And every single one of these uh, structures, what which is really a structured asset, needs to be institutional in nature. We need to have the rules of those, those uh, credits that are created or emissions accounted for clearly digitized. The only way to compare them, because we can't often see, touch, or feel these assets unless we go visit a project or pollution gets very bad, we need to understand the rules and make them comparable. We need to make sure not just the environmental data com is comparable, but the impacts to the communities that those credits are benefiting. So the key question is, can we prove the finance is actually going to the communities? Can we give the investors confidence that funding has gone to a specific community in a specific country that's driving this outcome to keep them incented to work on these projects? Um, recently, our team went to go visit a community in Senegal, and we're working on an ITMO project uh, in Tuba with uh, Alcott, who's a large-scale project developer. And one of the key elements that Alcott's working on is making sure that in that 6.2 ITMO project, which is the first composting project in Senegal, that they're not just supporting the project, but they have traceable financing to every partner involved so that that can be part of the same product that ultimately shows environmental data, that gives investors confidence so that when you take an asset that exists, you can turn it into not just a low-priced carbon credit or an ITMO, but something that investors pay a premium for because the data, the structured data product is fully digitized, fully elaborated in a way the investors can say, this is really happening. This is real, the impact's real, the reduction in methane is real, the reduction in CO2 is real, and it helps meet the global goals of the countries investing in the host country project. Yeah, I, I, maybe I'll also kind of echo what, what Wes said, but with the typical example with, with what we are doing right now. Uh, so we, we, we uh, had a kind of a simulation for the last uh, two and a half years in terms of trying to validate whether this kind of a platform is going to really work and then it, whether it would give the intended outcomes to the various stakeholders 
with the same data. So there is only one data, which is carbon credits data, but there are different players who are trying to use it for different purpose. So as he said, the, the community benefits, tracing the community benefits for the exchanges is a simple transaction and trading for them. The rating agencies, yes, now then they are going to basically make the investment community look better, more confident by doing a lot of ratings using this data. So there's going to be a multiplicity of uh, requirement uh, to see how we can supply the same data, but try to help these different stakeholders across the spectrum of climate finance so that you, you go for the high scale ambition in terms of reducing the uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So in, in terms of the use case, we, we uh, try to understand uh, from, from the portfolio uh, investors who have been doing this for the last two and a half decades in terms of trying to have a portfolio uh, of carbon credits projects, uh, making low difference or high difference in terms of the returns, but still they have a portfolio of carbon credits in millions of dollars, voluntary compliance and all that what Wes mentioned, but they couldn't really uh, make a pricing point in terms of how they could be priced and then transacted and then they move on and then they now they have it most different types of carbon credits coming up. So how do you assign the value of, of these credits? So to some extent, we understood that uh, the, the investment community can do a better portfolio analysis of these projects, uh, kind of a kind of an independent uh, analysis uh, of, of, the, of the credits from the same sectors. For example, if JP Morgan has a, a kind of a portfolio of only renewable energy from, from Africa, they would like to see how the similar portfolio will be comparable in other, another uh, region and therefore whether that could be a bucket of uh, different uh, carbon credits from different countries and then they put a, a kind of a combined portfolio the multiple projects portfolio it's a typical example but today they are doing it manually and then they don't have the data which is not uh, kind of real time and therefore the access to to the climate action data does the minute it has most of the voluntary and the national data probably this is going to make a huge difference. So that is one point of it. The other one, which which was touched a bit uh, indirectly is the tokenization aspect of it. What we see moving forward is that transactions that are happening beyond the primary, the exchanges, we are, we are even now visualizing it most being um, traded in the market in the secondary and tertiary. As we speak, Singapore is setting up the whole framework for doing uh, secondary transaction and host unilateral litmus so that the exchanges can play a huge role. This has never been thought in the market yet, but Singapore has gone ahead and started developing a framework where you need all these uh, uh, data from the independent and the compliance registries to be hosted. And, and then the tokenization happens and that gives a direct benefit to the community if you write a smart contract that each and every time the transaction happens, the farmer gets a small royalty, for example. It's a very simple way of traceability, but the benefit also goes to the community and they are very happy throughout the life uh, of, the, of, the pro of the project. So these are the two examples. That I give. That's great for that. And, and I think uh, kind of two things that jumped out at me. Um, uh, in terms of your comments, I think one relates to the, um, well, and Wes, you also made the comment around, um, you know, recognizing um, that there are various attributes, right, that are associated with these projects. Um, and there's various interests and various needs in terms of different players, right? Um, and the, and the uh, potential, the value um, that digital brings to the ability to be able to Kind of uh, assign those and 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 provide that kind of information to to different players, uh, and I think uh, Dinesh, the other thing is you talked about. I started at the outset talking about innovation in digital. I think what you also talked about is on top of building off of those innovations in digital, is the financial innovations that are possible, right? In terms of not going beyond just the primary markets the primary players into those larger pools, right? And what that may mean in terms of relating back to that overarching um, uh, capital markets uh, need and challenge, how do we bring those larger pools, those larger players into the mix and really um, bring their power to the scaling needs of, uh, of climate finance? So Juan, over to you. Thank you. And actually very important because the, the first question was more about how are we going to get all this finance to all these projects and make it not just profitable, but also traceable so that the investors feel secure what they are putting their money. So uh, I, I believe Wes addressed very well the part that we need to have uh, data 
that supports each one of the issues of the carbon units. That's the first thing. We need to have integration, and I believe that's uh, what Dinesh is doing in the CAT Trust, like how to integrate all the information systems so that we can share all that information and make sure what is happening on the market. Then you need to have also traceability to prove ownership of the credits, who has the credits and who is the end beneficiary at the end of all the transactions. And the other thing that I believe that the financial market needs to really get into the market is um, KYC processes, due diligence, so that you can recognize who is entering the market and what they are entering it for. And in that regard, then you can have different exchanges that can provide first market, secondary market, tertiary markets, it could be any any transaction, but then you will have uh, a little or not, not little, but less liability on counterparty risk and you can do some specific things about insurances that you could do on the projects or on the credits themselves. And those solutions will come when we have all the mechanisms in place to do traceability, data-driven decisions, and KYC process, and connectivity between all platforms. And, and I believe that's what we have all been working together to, to achieve. It's not easy, but we need to learn from the financial sector that, that has already implemented so, so, such things. Thanks for that. And, uh, uh, thinking about you know, other parts of the finance ecosystem, I'm thinking about insurability. I had a, ran a panel yesterday on the integration um, of DMRV and uh, and insurance, right? And how you've got large institutional players. We had Aon on the panel, right, talking about what they're doing as well as various startups, um, and how they see uh, the need both from a project developer standpoint as well as from a corporate buyer standpoint around. Um, uh, insurance risk production or protection products and services uh, and how that will help to scale. But fundamentally, they as uh, as insurers, it goes back to they need to have confidence in the underlying information around the products, uh, projects in order to be able to write those covers, right? So all of this kind of comes together. Um, I want to switch to another question and, and picking up on kind of a cross-cutting theme. I think I, I heard the language of um, uh, digital public goods, um, open frameworks, open standards. Um, so there's kind of a, a cross-cutting common theme around uh, each of you. Um, wondering if you can drill down into, and you've touched on this a little bit already, but into some of the benefits um, associated with open approaches, um, but also talking about, in addition to the benefits, what are some of the risks uh, and what are some of the safeguards that may need to be put in place to be able to, to have those flourish and function? Yeah, so I think one thing that we need to think about is digital public goods. It's infrastructure. What is infrastructure? It, it, it's a tool, whether it's a road or a digital MRV framework system that allows multiple parties to use it and scale something that wasn't happening before. And so if we treat our, our tools is an information highway. It needs to make it easier for someone to build, say, a methodology, compare a methodology, access data quicker than they could before, enable maybe the work of the validation and verification bodies to be compared, to enable reputations to exist for project developers and other market actors, including registries, to improve the quality, to improve the transactability of the assets. And so as we build infrastructure, it needs to speak in a common language. I'd say hi I'd highlight that, it, that as a risk. It needs to be based on, and that language doesn't need to be specific at a technical level, at a specification level, though it does. And so there's really great working groups that exist across the industry that are trying to address some of those risks. But those risks, we'll find out over time if they've successfully addressed them. One of them is the Inner Work Alliance from the Global Blockchain Business Council. They've actually started a few different task forces. Um, one is the Voluntary Ecological Markets Task Force, and they've really defined what is it, not just a tokenized carbon credit on a blockchain, but that digital asset, it, whether it lives in a database or a blockchain, how it's related to measurement, reporting, and verification. And that's thinking about the behaviors, the characteristics of the asset, even the actors involved. The Carbon Emissions Task Force has done the same thing. Actually, this past week, released their first paper um, defining what is an emission, so scope three, but also product carbon footprints 
that's aligned with some of the other specifications bodies in the industry, including the Pathfinder Framework, eLiability Institute, and uh, the Open Footprint Forum. And so if we don't follow specifications for our digital public goods and our infrastructure, I'd highlight that as a risk. But the opportunity is scale. The opportunity is to build systems that all talk to each other. So if the HBAR Foundation funds a piece of infrastructure and Eco Registry adopts that infrastructure, and then all of a sudden Climate Action Data Trust can understand just by understanding at an API level the specification, maybe we can build things that work together and that scale the market. And I think that's a key opportunity from our perspective. And when we go to fund, we try to fund things based on standards and we try to fund infrastructure that solves critical market problems that haven't been addressed so for us mrv frameworks marketplaces based on attributes are key areas where specifications of frameworks are helpful and we think digital public goods are very promising yeah no, but i still remember when we, when i first met this online he mentioned one key aspect of it he said uh, the source has to be referred if you don't refer the source or source the reference properly whatever you build across doesn't make any sense. So you come back where you started because uh, you had to trust the source. And once you trust the source, that gives you the whole chain, the value chain. Because unless you have the project, that data that is a, a kind of uh, attributed to that is not properly referred, everything is wrong. So the, the digital aspect is also equally exposed to that. And, and that's the only risk I feel that the data is not coming from all three of us at all the source data that comes from the field. So therefore, the kind of educating and engaging them to properly give the reference data, the way it can stand the time. We're talking about 100 years for carbon uh, forestry projects. So the data from the source from the day one becomes the risk as well as the solution for a successful digital infrastructure. That is, that's my major uh, premise. And, and he nicely put it to me, actually. Uh, whatever you, you build uh, doesn't make any sense if you don't have that, that kind of an access to give the right reference data from the source. We are talking about the documentation to start with. And on the other hand, the tokenization aspect of it and trying to really see how the community benefits, which I mentioned to you, uh, happens. The traceability becomes a bit more onerous if you introduce more, more systems, more checks, and then more processes, which are going to be very tech tech heavy uh, for, for the ultimate community. They don't have any clue what you guys are doing, but at least they have the belief that it is much, much better than before because they can see what, what, what's happening basically. So from that angle, the kind of thing, my, my, my entire premise goes to the community basically, whatever the, the question is, is largely because of the, the, the ways the open source uh, is trying to uh, kind of completely revolutionize and transform the kind of understanding and access equally becomes a challenge when you don't do it properly on on the systems which you mentioned and then the normal threats and the hacks and all those uh, issues which which you which any it guy would like to resolve it becomes very clear uh, rule book or the engagement of uh, rules of engagement from the day one and therefore i feel if you understand that and you have the building blocks properly uh, uh, kind of made ensure that we, we may have different tools. Uh, we may compete with each other for various aspects. That is that is not not a kind of a, a material issue. But the, the most material part is to understand how to simplify that aspect and make it very palatable to the community that is going to understand and appreciate what you guys are doing. So I'm not an expert on public goods and open source code. I use it, though, a lot. <laughs> I am very good beneficiary. So what I can tell is uh, from my perspective or from our perspective in the company, how how we see, for example, the work that HBAR has been doing and the work that the catchers have been doing. I, I, I get asked a lot why I engage with the catchers, why we were, for example, the first registry connected to the catchers, or why do we work together with the HBAR Foundation? If the, a lot of questions about if I, I don't fear losing the IP or something like that, a lot of people asking me that. And my answer is uh, open source opportunities, digital goods, digital public goods, what they bring and what they bring into the table that I believe is very valuable is the ecosystem. They start bringing an ecosystem of different players that want to implement real solutions that actually uh, focus on climate action but also are doing something. It's not just uh, the purpose of a specific company, but it's the purpose of the whole ecosystem. And I believe that's when such organizations come in place and bring this to the ecosystem, and that brings a lot of value to the solutions. That's from my perspective. 
before handing it over to you only one aspect is the governance which we again discussed is that the governance part is not fully now um, centralized or decentralized it's so like everybody sets their own governance in terms of how to access uh, the open source what are the threats and how do you overcome it i think that part also has to be kind of uh, there has to be an alliance of governance for the open source for the climate at least and that is an entity called dial d-i-a-l uh, which is which is kind of a un outfit uh, it existed for few uh, uh, kind of open source uh, public digital public good mm -hmm. and they have a wonderful background in terms of how they can take this forward so we are talking to them and trying to see how the uh, governance and the transparency issue could be resolved by having a kind of a well adopted uh, guidelines for, for the governance setup as well thanks for that um and maybe the last question is uh and and picking up again uh, some comments around um you know what's what ultimately critical here is the uh, the data at source right so talking about those projects in the field in the communities how that information is uh, that data is uh, is captured um I guess my, my question is uh in terms of the ability of these uh of these of the communities that you work with um you know their ability to understand accept embrace uh digital and what it means in terms of how that information is gathered um you know maybe maybe you can bring that to life in terms of you know, an, an example of a project that you're working on. I think you were talking about uh, just recently being in, in Senegal for, for a project. Um, so maybe that's one to speak to. But maybe just to give everyone a sense of what that looks like on the ground in terms of, you know, how that source data is captured and then it, how it flows into everything that we're talking about in terms of broader infrastructures. Yeah, I'm happy to do so. And, and one thing I'll say is when we talk about source data, a lot of times, you know, as technologists, we jump to just sensors. Um, but sensors are just one data point in context. We oftentimes have to bring data with context in climate projects. And most of the times, even when sensors are enabled within methodologies, they're oftentimes not adopted because the technological cost barriers or the technological complexity barriers on say communications um, and backhaul, basically communication systems so that we can write to the internet, write to the cloud or wherever we're taking data to. And so that's one of the big challenges in the markets. And, and we have project developers we work with who literally, you know, we were here at last COP and they were describing uh, how they collected data on little, not sheets of paper, slips of paper, but they ripped off small pieces of paper to write down cookstove readings um, to better monitor their cookstove. That's how they started back in 2010 when they were building cook, cook stoves for gold standard, long, long time ago on the carbon markets uh, spectrum. And those same cookstove developers, uh, it's a group called the Nova Institute in South Africa. They've actually worked within local communities uh, in Limpopo, outside of Johannesburg, and they've set up sensors on the side of cook stoves that they built in homes working with local rural women. And they've added sensors for ignition starts and stops to better understand um, heat, temperature, and other, other sensor elements. But they also have to consider the privacy of, you know, by adding a sensor to someone's home, what is that implication? Uh, and that's not where we just start with monitoring. It's having source monitoring from folks who are helping set up the projects, going into get into homes, doing kitchen performance tests and field studies rather than using standard estimates, which a lot of times the cookstove projects use. And so that's one specific example, but oftentimes um, we're thinking about beyond a sensor, beyond a specific field study, to be able to go do samples that go into labs and understanding where every single party, whether it's the, the lab itself or the folks who are collecting the sample or the folks who work on a farm every day, they're collecting data that contextually goes into the project. Now, one thing I'll say, and I'd love to hear maybe Juan's feedback on this as someone who works with registry technology, is many of the methodologies in registry technology don't account for collecting data that low level, that granular. And so there's an opportunity for us to, for registries to allow for more data to go in, but also consider the privacy sensitivities of that data um, and making sure that we still get the context that we're looking for from the source, whether it's satellite data, um, on the ground uh, data, lab data, or sensor data, and how those things work together to give the right context of that truth, and making sure it answers the question of the methodology, but we don't flatten all that information into a PDF, where we can never use that data again to actually derive the attributes that the markets may care about. And at the end of the day, that attribution that the market may care about could often be benefited by us not creating a PDF that's in black and white um, in two dimensions, and we can get all the richness out of that data 
without mining it for privacy, privacy laden information. <laughs> Perfect. No, and thanks. Uh, I'm going to answer first uh, what what Wes was just talking about. So and how we are engaging in that. We're working in some of the projects together with the with uh, beneficiaries from the HPR Foundation's uh, grants. One thing that we're developing for that is uh, there are two ways of, of doing things. Uh, I always believe in change and innovation, but uh, it is difficult to make change when the other stakeholders in the market are very difficult to change. One thing and w one th question that arises when Wes was telling about how to gather all this data and put it into a registry system is then the validation and verification body so the auditors they need to change their mindset because they will change from reading black and white to the pdds as, as you mentioned and uh, they will need to change from that to change to actually go and review measurement systems and find for example rare measurements uh, stuff like that and then audit algorithms more than audit paper so so that change is very difficult to do. So how we are addressing it from our perspective is that we do both at the moment. So we collect the data. With the data, we can do dashboards and everything. But we also automatically generate an Excel sheet and a PD file so, <laughs> so that the auditor can read it. Uh, and, and then we have auditors that are more tech savvy, and so to them we present okay here you have the dashboard and the data and the ones that are not so tech savvy here you, you have your PTD <laughs> and you can read it if you want so so that's how we are addressing that question and I believe that's a very important question right now because it will need to change the the market view of the process so that that's from one and, and then coming back to the example uh, one that i love uh, and we just got the results before i traveled here to the to to dubai uh, it's about uh, using lidar and ultrasound technology for measuring uh, afforestation and reforestation projects and uh, the difficulty there is that if you uh, and this is a project that we started in Colombia, I come from Colombia, and we started there when people started using satellite imaging to rate projects. And then we knew, everybody knew, that satellite imaging in the Amazon forest does not help you at all. If you ever have seen a, a screenshot of a satellite image from the Amazon forest, you will see only clouds. If you're able to see something, you will not be able to understand what is happening on the field. So actually, we started a project with a university, with a local company, and with an afforestation and reforestation project that we did actually the old way of measuring everything, that you have to measure tree by tree uh, with height and everything. And we did it with LiDAR technology, with light, uh, ultrasound, and with satellite imaging, the three of them at the same time. And we then started developing algorithms to match actually what you get on the field and uh, right now we are very confident and that's actually uh, let's call it a verification company that is offering that services but we as a registry platform we help them into saying okay let's go into this together and let's try to build your company actually because <laughs> because this was our efforts but they are the ones providing the service afterwards to do the verification process and 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 we do believe that that those those results will come uh, in the future uh, very often, and uh, I, I hope I, I hope I really hope that 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 will come because, and every single country every single area is different in a way. For example, at the beginning we we tried to work with the MIT, for example, and with another university in Europe that I recall, I don't recall which one. And then they were very enthusiastic about their technology. Uh, and, uh, and the only thing is, when are you going to fly here? And they tell, no, we're going to do everything in satellite. And I, and I just took the phone and tell them like, you're not going to do anything, but if you have something, just call me. <laughs> 
And it was like that. And then they told me, ah, but the, the Andes, if you, if you look at the Andes from a satellite, you cannot see the steep and then this and that. And I, I, told, I, I told you like one year ago, <laughs> if you're doing this with satellite imagery, don't bother, man. <laughs> let, let, let's try something new. But, but, but actually those guys, they saw them the project and, and they are now working with us. Okay, let, let's, let's try how to implement a solution that really works for the Andean region, and we can call it the Andean region solution. And then in Africa will be another one. And then maybe in Europe will be another one. In the US will be another one. It, uh, and it's different for every region. And that's very important. So I'll, I'll just add, uh, I, I won't take more than a couple of minutes here. Uh, my, my response will be from the from the extent that we have uh, from the building the CAT Trust data taxonomy. And <clears throat> me being all, uh, already in the old carbon days, we know how the PDD was initially designed by the UN and then how the whole data methodology was, was moving forward. So being one of the meta experts and, and the roster of experts of the UN, we always found exactly uh, what, what Wes and um, uh, Juan was mentioning in terms of how what, what is the adequacy of data and whether there are 200 parameters is adequate or 500. So it goes to the number of parameters and rather than the actual need of that data, which is going to live long to, to continue the to continue to show the value of the project. So base is that whatever uh, simulations that we carried out for the last two years with uh, almost 15 standards, uh, which which are in the in, in the public domain or doing various projects. So we have that data taxonomy now cut down from 180 parameters to around 80, 80, 81 parameters, co-parameters being only 40. But we feel definitely the users are going to come back and then say, no, 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 we need more and then we have to we, we may have to expand so the kind of standard uh, the, the the understanding is different from for different people in terms of how they want to have the standard so this is one part of the story the second one is what is going to happen now when voluntary uh, independent market is going to merge or converge with with the compliance market what kind of standards you're going to talk about a couple of days before we had a statement from eu talking about having all the voluntary independent standards to have a unified standards will it happen answer is no, it's not going to happen. But that's a way forward in terms of how you see the unified standards of the independent market to try to make a huge compelling case for merging with the compliance market. Whether you like it or not, it's going to happen. But I think the push has to come from the 500 methodologies or over from the independent standards and the compliance standards. And it's time to basically address that. Excellent, thank you for that. Um, and maybe we'll turn it to the audience, but um, before uh, to see if there are any questions, but we'll I'll, I'll, I'll just uh, mention to the panel here what I'll ask each of you to, to think about over uh, the course of the next minute or so uh, is uh, is leaving us with one kind of key takeaway in terms of Dinesh picking up on your, you know, where where to in the future? What uh, you know? What's one key? If you're going to focus on one key thing that's uh, that's critical to tackle and kind of really move the uh, yardsticks forward, what does that look like? So um, I'll put it out to the audience. Any uh, any comments or questions? Yeah, absolutely. You're on the hot seat. Uh, hey, I'm Anton from uh, Singapore. Um, Network effect. So the technology is great, the, the data sourcing, got it up and running. How do you build enough network effect to make this meaningful with the large FIs and corporates around the world? So what, when we think about network effects, it doesn't come from one solution. Our registry needs VVBs, project developers. Project developers need buyers. Um, buyers need customers who believe in sustainable products, net zero products. So there's network effects in kind of a horizontal sense of the entire value chain, but there's also network effect effects in the vertical sense of these types of solutions. So when we think about tools like the Guardian, which is that open source digital public good that we created around measurement, reporting, and verification, we've built the largest methodology library in the world. But how does that digitize an open source methodology library get adopted? It's by getting feedback and commentary as we go version to version to version. It's how we build a system of knowledge around methodologies that actually makes the methodologies better. If we don't make the methodologies better, we're not gonna have the effect that we wanna have on the market. But it's up to us to engage with different parties to use those methodologies. So what we've done is when we build in layers, we have that guardian, we have the methodology library that lives on top of that with dozens and dozens of methodologies available today, emissions, offsets, and otherwise. Um, what happens is then we go work with partners like Alcott. And Alcott says, okay, I have 
uh, projects in multiple different registries. And, and we, they have hundreds of projects that affect hundreds of communities, over 500 million metric tons uh, worth of credits tied to those projects. And we say, okay, well, how does that work with eco registry? How does that work with the other registries? How does that work with their VVBs to work across that value chain? But ultimately what we're working on is building those high quality data products that buyers are gonna say, I have confidence in this. I have confidence in the data behind the asset. I have confidence that the rules exist today, but they're getting better in the future. And I have confidence that I can see the financial flow that when I invest in this, I don't just see the money going to the project developer, the registry, the VVB, but what goes back to the communities. And so one of the key investments we made um, this year is in our partnership with Alcott is to work with them on opening the books. And what that means is we can understand the dollars into the same accounts of testing data, the same sources of testing data at the organizational level, we can watch financial flows go back into those communities. And so you say, well, what's the network effect here? We have the vertical network effect of the methodology library. We have the vertical network effect on all of these players understanding how to receive value and how to attest value in a digital sense. But we also have the network effect of corporations are now seeing where does my money go? Where, where is the data coming from? Am I now paying for an asset that I'm based on is based on a brand or is it a data driven product based on attributes where I know where the data comes from that derives that attributes or derives those attributes. And that's the type of network effect that we look at horizontally in the value chain and vertically in the different categories of that market life cycle. So those modules that uh, Juan was referencing. I would just add to, to what Wes said that uh, with this data-driven solution give us the opportunity to make a continuous improvement over the process. And that is actually what at the end gives uh, confidence to the market. One thing that we cannot do and from my perspective is like, okay, this doesn't work, let's go to another. But that doesn't work, let's go to another way. And uh, that, that doesn't help anybody. Actually, then what we see is something is failing. For example, one thing that we are also working on is uh, also with Alcott and, 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 and the HR Foundation is the financial disclosure of the, of the impact and the re real impact in the projects. And that's very important because that has been questioned uh, about uh, a lot in the carbon market. So how, how, is, how is the beneficiary to the communities? And, uh, and that's very important, how to trace back all that information and, and be able to show here. That's how they are spending their money. So, so those are just small steps, but from lots of small steps, you can do something better. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, uh, my name is Ibrahim. Uh, first of all, thank you, uh, all the panelists, for your insights. It's really helpful. My question is um, uh, we are trying to develop a national climate data sharing platform in the Maldives. Uh, and we have found like two key challenges. One is in different government institutions, they are storing data in different formats. Uh, some of, uh, most of the data is in printed form and, and then PDF and also you have Word documents. So the challenge is like, I mean, developing the data schema and coming up with a standard is in to feed in the climate data sharing platform. So what would be your advice or suggestion to, to uh, I mean, address these challenges and the second challenge is like the ownership of the data who owns the data even though it's a government institutions different institutions have been like saying that no, no, we own this data we are not ready to share the data so this is a huge challenge so even though the government is working for the uniform course it's a huge challenge So I think we can break that into a few different areas. So one is the specifications around data and the others around privacy. And I think that there are some elements of the, you know, we have good examples out there on what data sharing could look like or should look like to make it high quality, but still respect privacy. So on the emission side of the, in the emission side of things, the Pathfinder framework has different, you know, even ratings of good, bad, and better, um, or bad, bad, bad satisfactory and, and better in terms of how you rate the level of sharing to prove the data quality. 
But in the carbon in the carbon markets, we have certain data standards that the uh, Inner Work Alliance or the Global Blockchain Business Council has released in the Voluntary Ecological Markets Task Force. So recently, um, uh, in the last few months, uh, uh, a digital measurement reporting and verification specification came out. It's version two of that specification. Um, recently, in the HBAR Foundation, we, we've uh, supported the funding to adopt those properties, is what they're called. Um, there's 197 of them as part of the Guardian framework. So it's a, literally a drop-down menu of those properties to implement that specification um, on top of Hedera, but also by projects. Some of those projects are actually working with one eco-registry team. So it's actually easily interoperable when you know you see what Juan has done and you know just by leveraging what's out of the box and then you can take that if you have a cook stove methodology or a renewable energy uh, focused methodology or any other type of methodology you can see even comparable fields what that looks like now if you say how does that apply to an itmo if you're using the same specification and you write out the methodology in the same way you should be able to look at them side by side and understand what property next to another property across the different standards now, in some cases, some of that data should be private. It should be PII, maybe in certain very limited situations, there's proprietary information that has to be considered. Although, especially when you're creating an offset we, or credit, we, we encourage it to be open as part of our principles as the foundation. Um, there's a concept called selective disclosure. Now, selective disclosure, oftentimes in the emerging technology world, we hear zero knowledge proofs or other types of variants of that. Um, that selective disclosure means that your private data is gonna stay private, but you wanna publicly log that, that that's there. And the way that we do that is when we open source the methodology, we can say this field has a confidential checkbox. So when somebody answers it, we expect them to sign a transaction in a certain way where the information may be left on the local device or a hash, an encrypted uh, hash would be put on a public ledger so that you can actually know that, hey, there's a question here. There's an answer to that question. But if you want to understand the answer to that question, you need to go through some type of workflow to either get permission to that or maybe you can't access it anymore because that's a very specific piece of proprietary information or personally identifiable information that you know needs some further verification that you're entitled to access it or maybe use it. And in the case of a government, the government oftentimes may be entitled to see it but may not have the right to share it with somebody else. And so that's the type of technology that is available today that maybe wasn't available 10 years ago to help facilitate that credible disclosure of information without violating someone's privacy or proprietary information. I would just add something and some efforts that have, have been done, for example, by the World Bank. Uh, about they, they have this program called the Climate Warehouse, actually where the Cat Trust came from. <laughs> that was actually the origination of the Cat Trust. It's a project called the Climate Warehouse. They have... Um, advanced models about standardization for data models and how to collect data, for example. That would be one thing. Uh, the other thing is how to manage privacy. And of course, um, I would then recommend that there are also other standards like ISO 2701 and SOC 2 standards like to manage privacy and data management systems. So yeah, my, my first, my, my first um, Thing would be look at uh, vendors or platforms uh, that can offer you both of the world of the tools like uh, using the standardized information models it could be it could be the world banks it could be any other to connect for example to HBAR or that they can manage that information but that they also can give you the confidentiality and access to the information that is confidential Okay, thank you everyone. Recognizing that uh, we've got w about one minute left in uh, our allotted time, we did a great job uh, <laughs> taking the full hour. Uh, I'll turn it back to each of our panelists just to, to give that one, uh, one top of mind takeaway in terms of uh, you know, a key thing that they see as, a, as an opportunity or a challenge moving forward in, in, in advancing all of this. I'd say the key opportunity um, you know, in our digital innovations that we each work on, is building systems that don't have to be the single point of control, but collaborate to achieve the outcome. We're better when you have every single logo here that's a, a co-host or a sponsor or a participant in this pavilion working together to achieve climate outcomes, um, working with host countries, working with uh, you know countries that are trying to innovate in addition to the private sector actors to achieve those outcomes. And oftentimes we get very focused on our specific issues, but we have to listen to everyone else just as much as we have to share what we're working on 
And I think that's the opportunity for all of us as we take as we you know take our reflections back from COP, but also think about for the rest of COP, what we're bringing to COP is that collaboration and trying to collaborate towards the goals. Exactly. And I'm, I'm going to say the same thing in different words. Uh, what I heard yesterday was we always are very good in talking at people and not with people. Uh, I think whatever. That's why I started the uh, the conversation like the, the digital may revolutionize, transform everything but it's ultimate for the public good or for the community benefit, we are doing all this stuff. So I think the, the top down is never going to be successful at all. And that's how you have the success of the Paris Agreement, which is going bottom up. And therefore, talk with people and not talk at people. Yeah, for me, it's, uh, one thing is the ecosystem. Building the ecosystem is important. And the, the, the challenge that we face is um, the thing I mentioned earlier about when we see that some solution is failing, like throwing it away and then starting a new one and then throwing it away and starting a new one that doesn't help anybody. Thank you. All right. With that, I'll, uh, I'll conclude today's uh, session. Again, a gr uh, huge appreciation and thanks for each of our three panelists and, uh, and to all of you that are here today and, and dialing in. So thanks very much.